I strongly believe that these engagements are important, uh, especially because uh, not only do they help us to better understand uh, our environment, and that's for, the, for us in the public sector, but also I think it also helps uh, the private sector and policy makers and thinkers to understand uh, the government's own, as it were, side of the argument especially because, you know, the whole aim is to achieve some, you know, positive impact uh, in the economy. I don't intend to burden you uh, with information which you must already be quite familiar, yeah, especially the country's uh, macro statistics, fiscals, the main features of the 2019 budget. These are issues, I'm sure, uh, that will be in some material that we have come across. Uh, We've also heard, of course, from uh, Doni's uh, prognosis on the economy uh, this year and beyond, uh, which contains, I must say, a little more bad news uh, than is polite to be fed with at breakfast. But, um, you know, uh, thankfully, economists are usually wrong, you know. And, <laughs> and I'm quoting the economist and, uh, you know, several other uh, very good authorities on this matter. But, uh, I, but frankly, I, I must say that I do agree uh, with doing on many of the very important uh, points that he made, in particular about incentivizing private capital through the development of markets, looking you know, at our economy, in, uh, especially from the regulatory point of view, from the point of view of markets as opposed to sectors. And this is a problem, you know, and I think he put his finger uh, very uh, rightly on it. It's a problem that we have with regulators because we're, regulators, of course, are almost trained in their minds to look at IGR, how do we develop IGR, such that what the report you get from customs is uh, the IGR that customs is making, as opposed to how customs has facilitated exports or improved uh, the, the, the ease of uh, imports and, and all of that. So I think that that's something that we certainly need to do. And we started doing a lot of that, especially with the MSME clinics that we're doing, where we take the regulators round uh, to meet with uh, the actual players on the ground. And what, 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 what we've been saying to the regulators and what we hope uh, we'll get across is that the regulator is a facilitator. Is it shouldn't become an obstacle, must be a facilitator of business. And I think that in some senses, uh, Doing puts it much better where he says that we should be talking about developing markets uh, as opposed to uh, uh, merely sectors. Then, of course, the other point which he makes, I think, is also important, is about deepening broadband connectivity, and I might talk about that uh, briefly also. It's no question at all. And this is a very fundamental part of uh, our next level agenda, a very fundamental part of uh, the, the, the sorts of things that we intend to do. Uh, and I'll, as I said, I, I might mention that. But the last point which he makes is simply what we need to do to develop the size of our economy if, if we're in the next 10 years. I think it's very important to emphasize that practically everything we do must be done on scale. I mean, really must, we, we must really talk more about scale than anything else. And I think that that's one of the principal concerns that we have, one of the principal issues that we have, thinking through economic policy, how to deal with issues on scale. Because practically everything, you know, really has to do with scale. But I'll, I'll, I'll just focus, and, I, and this will, I hope that I'll be able to go through this quite quickly because I'm sure that people may have a few questions to ask. Uh, some of the big economic issues, you know, uh, human capital development and, you know, jobs going forward, creating wealth, uh, rolling back poverty, how to earn more domestic resource uh, mobilization, how to attract more local and foreign investments, you know, uh, and then containing the old and new security threats, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, I'll just try and focus on a few of these, and hopefully uh, when we do take the questions, I might be able to elaborate a bit more. Our greatest challenge today, of course, is how to take uh, the very many millions of Nigerians out of extreme poverty. And, uh, and I know that we all appreciate that this will take a multi-pronged approach. 
every activity that conduces to creating jobs and opportunities will also invariably touch the poverty problem. There are some things that are clear to us. Uh, first is that, uh, that, uh, uh, that all price-driven GDP uh, growth may have very little impact on poverty. And I think this has been demonstrated time and time again. So sometimes when we look at our GDP, uh, and uh, looking at all the figures that Doing had uh, in 1990, et cetera, et cetera, compared to China, for example, I mean, it's clear that uh, the reason why we saw a decline is because as from 1990, I mean, there really wasn't any development in any other sector. We relied f fully on oil prices. So once oil prices increased, GDP increased. I mean, there wasn't really very much else going on, you know. And, and I think that that's one of the problems that we've had uh, going forward. And we need to ensure that growth makes sense from the point of view of job creation, from the point of view of actually creating opportunities. You know, so when we look at the growth, because sometimes we say, okay, 6%, 7% is where we ought to be. But we did achieve 7%. Uh, at some point, consistently at least over 6%, and yet poverty increased, debt increased, you know, which of course shows that, you know, there was something wrong with that kind of growth. And that's why, for me, focusing on certain key issues that we need uh, to develop the opportunities, to develop the markets, to develop the economy, is perhaps the way we should go, you know, and we should just keep our eyes on the ball in respect of those particular things. So, uh, you know, just taking a number of very sensible steps in key sectors of the uh, socioeconomic environment, I think this will better uh, position us to surmount some of the major challenges. I also believe that Nigeria is, a, is at a very auspicious time in her history. And I strongly believe that the fresh opportunity that we've been given, and when I say we, I refer to the government uh, of President Mohamed Buhari, will enable us to consolidate on some of the critical reform efforts that we've embarked upon and to, you know, uh, see how uh, and to make a real difference uh, going forward. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, a bit of uh, what I had wanted to, to say about the economy. As I said, you know, we... Uh, moved on from, you know, uh, the recession. It's now good to see that we're at least at 2.1% uh, of GDP. I'm, and it wasn't doing that predicted that we wouldn't ever get to 2% in 10 years. It was one of the, uh, one of the economists uh, who, who said that, you know, but uh, I think it was even a bit more optimistic uh, in, the, in the dark days of the recession. But we are, you know, uh, on... A, 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 on on uh, an upward trajectory. Uh, the uh, 2019 budget projects our intention to accelerate in particular transportation, infrastructure, uh, and cutting down, especially on recurrent spending through uh, potential measures, including the full implementation of IPIS uh, and the deployment of the National Trade Platform, otherwise known as a single window. That's a very important thing for us especially when it comes to ease of doing business and when it comes to our imports, you know, and export procedures, trade facilitation generally, it's the, the single window is very important for us. It's, very, it's been slow in coming on stream, but we think that this is something that um, we now have an opportunity. It was approved uh, at the very last uh, FEC, so we now have a real opportunity uh, to implement that. Out of our budget, total budget of 8.9 uh, trillion or so, 2.9 of it is devoted to capital expenditure. This amounts to 31% of total FGN expenditure. Overall budget deficit of is about 1.9 trillion, and this represents about 1.37% uh, of GDP. But the pr problem, of course, is not, uh, as the economists will tell us, I mean, we, we have, when we look at our, you know, uh, uh, when we look at our debt service to GDP, it's still okay, but it really is a revenue issue. I mean, it's revenue that we're, we're lacking in. So when we look at our revenue uh, to debt service, that is, uh, is, is a major problem. So one of the key issues for us is definitely how to raise revenues because, you know, uh, to, we need to improve revenues and lower uh, our debt service obligations, uh, which currently amount uh, to 
uh, uh, which currently amounts to about, uh, I believe, almost uh, 37 or so percent of uh, of revenue. I think 27 percent, I think it is, of revenue. I'm not entirely certain of that figure. Now, how do we want to raise revenue? In the immediate term, some of what we're looking at is restructuring the joint, uh, our joint venture oil assets and the reduction generally of uh, government equity in uh, petroleum joint ventures to about, so we're looking at reducing uh, to about 40%. At the same time, all unencumbered oil assets are being recovered, you know, uh, and we're doing that uh, progressively now. Uh, we're also looking at how to increase um, our, uh, and I'm sure that uh, when you do engage with uh, the GMD and NPC, you'll be able to tell us more about how we're trying to increase oil production. From an all-time low, as you know, of about 1.4 million barrels per day in 2016, in fact, sometimes following, falling below 1 million, we've reached about 1.96 uh, million uh, barrels per day, especially in the first quarter of 2019. Our aspiration, of course, is to reach the 2.3 uh, million barrels per day that's contained in our, in our budget. We're well aware that our greatest challenge today, you know, as I've said, you know, repeatedly, is how do we take, you know, as the President has said, 100 million people out of poverty in the next 10 years, which, which means an average of about 10 million yearly. So the overriding theme of our priorities, especially in this second term, is to really build an economy that generates opportunities for businesses, create jobs for people. Uh, you know, and um, beginning, for instance, with uh, our focus on agriculture, and I think agriculture is one key area where we, uh, uh, just as Duny has said, where we intend to do a lot more. Now, if you look at what we've done in, in agriculture so far, I think it's very clear that... Um, First, just as has been pointed out, we have more people in agriculture than ever before. And we are self-sufficient, you know, uh, to a large extent at least in production of several of the grains that um, we set out to be self-sufficient in, rice, sorghum, millet, etc. Now, milling has been a problem, you know, despite the fact that we have more paddy than we really need for our current, uh, for our current needs, but uh, getting more people into milling, getting more investment in rice milling has proved to be slower than we thought, although we now see, of course, increased activity in milling, but we need to, uh, to, to, to upgrade that. But aside from that, I mean, what, what, what we've done in order to encourage people to come into farming, especially smallholder farms, and by the way, uh, I, I, I very strongly believe that if we get more people engaged in, especially in many of the rural areas, more people engaged in, uh, in smallholder farms, uh, smallholder farming, and at, this, and at an outgrower type, uh, an outgrower type setting, which is what we have at the moment with our Anchor Borrowers Program, we really can do a lot more. We really can do a lot more. And, and, and this has proved to be quite successful in several of the states where we introduced the Anchor Borrowers uh, Program. And we intend to expand the Anchor Borrowers Program to, you know, covering uh, a, a much larger, a, a much larger number. For instance, we're looking at doing about between 1 million and 1.5 million new uh, smallholder farms, which uh, using, again, the Anchor Borrowers Method. And then expanding the opportunities for bigger players in, in the agricultural market. But I think one of the most important things that we're doing is our collaboration with the Brazilian government on uh, mechanizing agriculture. And uh, I may not have enough time to look, at the, to, to look at that in detail, but that's a very important plank in, 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 the, in, our, in our agricultural policy. It's called the Green Imperative. The whole idea is uh, that we're mechanizing uh, the, uh, the, we're mechanizing agriculture and especially also the, agro, the entire agro allied value chain. And what we're doing is that in almost all of the local governments, we intend to set up service centers. There'll be assembly plans for small mechanized, um, uh, for, for, for small uh, uh, machines, agricultural machines and equipments. 
which uh, is part of a, a which is part of a uh, a package that the Brazilian government has offered us and which we are taking. They are providing uh, most of the equipment, you know, worth about a billion dollars, and they are working with the private sector in, you know, and they, for instance, the assembly of tractors, uh, the assembly of milling plants and all of those kinds of things. And all of these centers are meant to be largely private sector driven and focused on farm settlements or farms in different, in the different local governments. And we think that if we spend, uh, if, if we develop these service centers well, it will be an important way of, of improving productivity on the farms and also of encouraging uh, the, uh, the entire value chain and making the entire value chain much more productive. We're looking at 109 of these service centers located uh, in most of the local government, or at least in the senatorial uh, zones. And uh, we also hope that uh, we will be able to cover practically every one of the, the, the value chains in grains, livestock, uh, poultry, fruits, foods, etc. Everywhere, every one of the uh, different sectors of the, of the economy. So, the, so aside from agriculture, you know, industrialization is also, of course, a key issue for us. Now, uh, Doreen has pointed out that we need to spend, you know, that we need to do a lot more in terms of industrialization. And I think that that, that, is entirely, uh, that is entirely correct. Now, I believe that for industrialization, you know, uh, where we start, or where, where, we, where we intend, uh, what is the major plank of our own, uh, of our planning, is the special economic zones. We think that um, if we're able to develop the special economic zones along the lines that we have, that we've planned, and of course right now we've started on that uh, very, very actively. Uh, across the country, we are we have about uh, six different uh, uh, special economic zones that we're developing. Uh, the whole idea, of course, is to have these uh, places where we can focus attention on creating a conducive atmosphere for uh, processing, for manufacturing and industrialization. Uh, the project that I refer to in the special economic zones is called Project Mine, made in Nigeria for export. And this, as I said, is a major plank of our industrial policy. And what we've done so far is that we have started, uh, in, uh, there are about two that have uh, started already. Of course, we're all familiar with the Lagos uh, Special Economic Zone, uh, the Lekki Special Economic Zone. Then there's the Eniba City, which has also gone very far. Uh, the whole idea in these areas is that here is what we hope will be a public-private partnership, but we're spending, government is spending most of its own resources on actually building the infrastructure in many of these areas. So, for example, uh, in Aimba City, uh, a lot of the infrastructure has already, uh, been, is already going in there, including power plants, etc., the, we're also doing something in Katsina, the Funtua uh, cotton aggregation in Katsina. That's also another of the economic zones that we're planning to develop. With this, you know, we hope to improve the utilization of uh, resources and all of that. And we also, we, we also hope that we can enhance uh, infrastructure in very significant ways to ensure that those who are engaged in uh, industrial development in our special economic zones have enough, uh, you know, have, have, have an, an environment that enables them to produce at, at maximum capacity. We also intend to enhance infrastructure in other small and medium, and in some cases large economic clusters that are already in existence across the country. And just to take a few examples, we are, we are going to, we are looking at the leather hubs in Abba, in Abia State, Ogidi in Alhambra State and uh, Kano, and then ironworks and fabrication clusters in Inewi, uh, in Bauchi also. And already, you know, we provided some uh, infrastructure in shared facilities 
in some of the states. But the whole point is that we want to make sure that where we have existing economic clusters, we go in there to assist with uh, power, with other you know, uh, infrastructural needs that they may have there, so that we're not necessarily uh, creating new uh, zones or new clusters, but enhancing those that we have so that they can be much more, uh, so that they can be much more productive and, you know, they, they, they can do a lot more in their, in, in, they can do a lot more right where, where they are. Another issue, of course, is power. And, of course, there's been a lot of talk about power. There's no question at all that we need a radical solution in our power sector. Very, very radical solution. And we're looking at several uh, ways out. The, the most important issue, and I think uh, Doni has already alluded to it, is that the market must attract more money. Many of us, of course, know that the discos, you know, simply do not have the resources uh, to do what is required, especially to ensure that power gets uh, to the last, uh, the last mile, gets to the consumer. I mean, while we are generating as much as 8,000 uh, megawatts of power, of course, what actually gets to the consumer is still under 4,000 uh, megawatts of power, you know, averagely. Of course, there are times when it's even lower than that. And the simple reason, of course, is, is that, uh, of course, uh, the distribution companies have their own complaints. They have all sorts of complaints. But bottom line is that we must improve distribution assets. There must be more investment in distribution assets in particular. You know, and that cannot come unless there's fresh money coming into, into the market. I think that the, the hint as to where we are going is really the improvement in what we call the eligible customer type situations as the willing buyer, willing seller. That really is where, where this is headed. There is no question at all that we cannot continue in the same old ways where discos control territory that they cannot service. There's just no way that's going to continue. Where there are those who can produce and distribute power, you know, and I think that what the discos will argue and what we also will, would have to accept is that we really have to have cost-reflective tariffs one way or the other. Well, the way that is worked, I mean, in the experiments we have seen, what we have seen and what we've done, is that, for example, in what we call the energizing economies, uh, uh, the, the energizing economies projects that we've done, where we've actually provided private power, we've enabled private power in markets, for example, we enabled private power in the Sabongari market, which is a massive market in Kano. Now, the private power supplier agrees with uh, the, um, uh, the with market uh, with the with the stall owners and shop owners agrees a price of power, and they provide the power, and everybody is happy. Nobody is complaining about those uh, those arrangements. Same as in our area market in Aba. In fact, in our area market in Abba, we have both a solar solution and uh, a fuel-based uh, solution as well. Both are privately, uh, both are, 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 are private power uh, arrangements with the with the stall owners and shop owners in the area market. Everybody is very happy with it. Of course, the tariff is cost-reflective. You know, we also have the same arrangement in Sura Market in Lagos, in Sikon, in Ondo, and you know, where and we think that this model works, but this model doesn't necessarily agree with our current regulatory structure, and I think that the current regulatory structure just has to accommodate the realities, and we've got to make sure that we're able to move ahead. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves, you know, as we are at the moment, regulating. 4,000 megahertz of power for the next uh, four years, which obviously is a disaster. So I think that our regulators, and I'm looking at uh, regulator, I'm looking at NEC chairman here, and our regulators just have to see that we, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't sit here complaining about some people who are providing power and, the, you know, and saying hey, cancel the license of people who are providing power. It's not going to work. So this, you know, where, I, as I said, we're, you know, in full discussions at the moment on how to really restructure uh, the, the, the sector so as to achieve uh, more investment in the sector 
and, and definitely to improve uh, power supply reaching uh, the consumer. Uh, aside from uh, power, uh, the, there's also, of course, gas development. I'm not going to talk uh, very much about it so I can give enough time uh, to, uh, uh, for questions. But, you know, gas obviously is an area where we intend to do a lot more, where we intend to attract a lot more investment. And uh, maybe I might have a bit of time if questions are asked about how we intend to go about that. Our social investment program is also one that we intend to uh, do a lot more in. We intend to expand that because we believe that in order to take uh, the numbers of people that we, we have to take out of poverty, not only do we have to create jobs, we also have to ensure that those who are at the bottom of the, of the ladder who do not generally have access to credit are given credit or on those who cannot work are given some form of support. And I think that's the whole point of, our, of, of, of the social investment policy. Aside from that, even creating the opportunities and creating jobs, if we rely solely on industry picking up quickly enough to be able to create the opportunities, obviously that will, that, that will give rise to a situation such as we've had in the past years, where more and more people are coming out of school and are not engaged in any way at all. And that's why we started the Empower program, where we've engaged 500,000 young people at the moment. And we provide them with the opportunity to work and to learn at the same time, because we provide a lot of learning materials on the devices which we give them, so that they're able to learn, you know, some are in agriculture, you know, learn the, what we call the Enagro, some are in NTeach teachers and all of that. And what that does is that because we know that we, look, we have about 1.7 million uh, young people coming out of school, both tertiary and non-tertiary, and coming out into the job market practically every year. If we're able to take some of that, you know, at least for a period as we watch uh, and as we, you know, uh, work on other aspects of the economy, that at least takes some of the uh, bite away from the problems that we have with unemployment. And we intend to expand uh, that. We intend to do more in terms of engaging more young people for the two-year period uh, of, the, of the Empire program. There's, of, of course, also school feeding, which uh, has its own uh, multiplier impacts in uh, different aspects of the economy. At the moment, we're feeding about 9.5 million children in about 30 states. We still have six states that we haven't been to. And this is a daily, this, you know, we're, we're feeding this number daily. We intend to do 36 states, all, all the states of the Federation, including Abuja. What, what, what that has meant, of course, is not just, you know, uh, improved uh, uh, nutritional, uh, improved uh, nutritional outcomes of the children, but also it's also increased uh, school enrollment in some places by as much as 40%. <laughs> And, in, and that ties to some of the other issues that we're trying to deal with in human capital development, education and health care and all of that. I'm not going to, again, I won't elaborate too much on education and health care, only to say that we recognize that unless we do something really uh, big on education, you know, in particular, we really may have a problem uh, on our hands. Now, what we've been doing with the states, uh, we've had a number of meetings with the states and we're having another set of meetings on Thursday, is to look at how to enforce the nine-year uh, free, uh, free and compulsory education, the first nine years of the life of a child, free and compulsory education, and to enforce that. This is uh, the policy of the federal government, and we believe that that must be enforced, especially because, you know, I mean, we know that these are the critical years of a child's life. But more importantly, you know, what we've seen in several states is just a high number of children that are out of school. And, that, and there's just absolutely no uh, attempt to enforce this policy of ensuring that children are in school compulsorily for the first uh, nine years of their lives. But we're looking at how to... Uh, we're looking at how to ensure that that is done, especially with incentives from the federal government for those that are able to, for those states that are able to comply. 
and uh, again aside from that we also have all of the uh, the programs on STEM uh, we call it STEAM rather than STEM education because we include arts uh, science technology engineering and maths again I don't want to spend too much time on on that because it's a whole uh, it's, it's, it's a big uh, it's a whole big subject but just to emphasize that the way that we, we the, the way that our every child counts uh, policy would work is that there must be uh, what we've described as STEM education and how this would work teacher skills have to be improved we have to teach teachers how to deal with the whole question of an integrated way of teaching especially in the critical areas that we think uh, uh, must work for a whole approach to you know digital literacy we expect that in this area of in the digital uh, space that's where the most opportunities are going to come from and where we think we can leapfrog so we really must emphasize you know uh, digital literacy skills and that's why STEM education is important for us and why we're emphasizing uh, the whole area of STEM education. Uh, what we call the government's uh, roadmap for lit uh, digital literacy involves not just um, teaching of those skills, but also teacher education. Teacher education is, is extremely uh, critical. And of course, in the, different, uh, in the different states of the Federation, in the different zones, the requirements are different. And so it's not a one size fits all in terms of the approach. And we're looking, you know, at how to ensure that we're able to address all of the concerns in the different zones of the country. Some are far behind in some areas and some, you know, are maybe a little further ahead. So we're trying to ensure that we take into account all of the different nuances so that we're not just, um, uh, we're, we're not just applying a one size fits all. We, we have a countrywide curriculum anyway, and this, is, this has been developed where we're looking at how to in, include coding, digital arts, design thinking, robotics, critical thinking, and other skills which we think need to be taken into account in, you know, in uh, going forward in our educational system. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot of work uh, that's going into that, and uh, in the past few months in particular, we've been holding several meetings uh, with educators, especially uh, in the public sector, looking at how to ensure that we're able to deliver on this, um, uh, on this STEAM uh, educational system that, that we've described, and how to ensure that that works, you know, especially at, the, at all of the different levels and, you know, the different zones of the country. Uh, aside from that, healthcare, you know, uh, for us the most important uh, feature is how to enhance healthcare financing. And we think that the national health insurance and its, and its you know, various uh, iterations is what needs to be done. The most important thing, of course, is uh, compulsory uh, health insurance which, as you know, has now been passed into law, and uh, we, we, are, we are not we're implementing that. We think it's important for being able to pull in the resources required for improving healthcare generally, especially uh, hospitals and other uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure, but also how to uh, ensure that most Nigerians do not have to spend uh, Money, we do not have to just, you know, uh, most, because as you know today, most people uh, is, uh, who have to spend on healthcare is out of pocket. And that, of course, creates very, very many uh, problems, especially because most people simply don't have the resources. But we think that uh, with the national health insurance, and as I said, some of the other iterations, because we are looking at some things that have worked in other systems, there is uh, some. Uh, we're talking to micro and shore, which uh, is a variation of uh, national health insurance. What that involves is actually giving people money uh, when, they are, when they have to go to hospital, actually just giving them money directly as opposed to, be, as opposed to paying hospitals. Now, the difference, of course, is that most people uh, who... Uh, need to go to hospital, usually just need some money. 
to be able to go to hospital rather than, you know, a situation where, uh, you, you, uh, when you get to hospital, of course, a lot of times, you know, uh, even hospitals are not particularly happy with, uh, their, uh, w- w- with a lot of the uh, service providers that they have and turn, turn back patients. So they really want someone who is able to pay. And, you know, MicroInsure, for example, has a method which we think, you know, might be useful where actual cash is paid to persons when you, when you prove that you are, uh, that you need to go to hospital or you're in hospital for a period of two days or three days. The whole, you know, uh, system which we are also looking at. Finally, let me just talk very quickly about uh, security, old and new security challenges. Uh, we have for several years, as you know, battled with Boko Haram, and uh, at some point you know that uh, Boko Haram was in 14 local governments uh, in the northeast, and we also, you know, uh, had Boko Haram practically in, you know, many parts of the north, including, you know, coming here to Abuja. Now, that is largely restricted to uh, northern Bono, and we know that um, by and large, you know, uh, the Boko Haram insurgency is being contained. But that's not the only threat. I mean, a new rising threat, of course, is uh, uh, what is called ISIS West Africa, which uh, is in some in a new a new insurgency or a new group of insurgents, you know. And we, of course, have to deal with both uh, the Boko Haram and the, and the I- ISIS West Africa, or what they call, sometimes it's called Islam, uh, Islamic State of West Africa, ISWAP. But the, 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 the point, of course, is that every new threat of violence, extremism, creates you know, uh, of course, all sorts of challenges wherever we've seen. But we need to, we as, 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 as a government, and this is what we're focused on, we need to not only contain uh, what there is, but also long-term prevent this from happening. We've, and there are so many things that have been done. Cooperation with uh, other states, the, Sahel, with the states in the Sahel, uh, cooperation with several of our West African neighbors is one of the critical issues. Uh, cooperation with some of our foreign partners is also uh, an issue that uh, we're, we're dealing with. You know, we're also uh, trying to ensure that uh, we are able to use local intelligence a lot more. Local intelligence, local support, community policing and all of that. We're trying to do a lot more in that respect. Fortunately, the current Inspector General of Police has, you know, considerable expertise in this area. And we're trying to, you know, work together with uh, several of the states to see how we can deal with uh, several of the states in in the Northeast in particular, to see how we can use local intelligence more. One of the problems, of course, we've had is getting adequate equipment for the military that uh, sometimes is more of a problem than uh, is imagined because, again, there are difficulties, you know, with uh, getting equipment for reasons, you know, of uh, international politics and uh, uh, the, the, some of the constraints that uh, even some of our partners have with respect to providing us with the right type, uh, with the right type of equipment. Sometimes it takes very long to just get the equipment. Uh, for example, for a long time, we were trying to get uh, the uh, we're, we're trying to get uh, the uh, uh, the fighter jets from from the U.S. You know, but uh, fortunately, in the last uh, two years or so, we we're able to get a, a breakthrough on, on, on that. By, by the way, the, the jets are actually Brazilian jets, but of course, using U.S. Um, using U.S. components and equipment. But the uh, we were able to uh, break through, we got a breakthrough on that, and uh, the government actually assisted in, in being able to get, the, that, that's the U.S. government, assisted us in being able to get uh, firm, to make firm orders and to make some progress on that. But we're not likely to get the jets until uh, 2020, which, you know, again, 
means that we're going to have to do without that. And then, then, you know, several other constraints that that there are just uh, in uh, accessing the kind of equipment that is required to fight these, uh, to to, to fight insurgencies and all of that. Now, I I think that one of the things that we need to do a lot more, and, and this, of course, also the international community, is that we face a major threat, you know, across the world, violent extremism across the world. And I think a lot more has to be done in terms of cooperation to do so, so that we don't really need to uh, worry ourselves too much about just getting the right equipment and being able to access the right equipment and those kinds of things. I think that the level of cooperation that's required today in order to prevent the spread of violent extremism, especially, you know, uh, especially in the Sahel, is one that really calls for uh, much more cooperation. Of course, you know, this is not just uh, saying that the uh, international partners must cooperate with us more, but also that we must be more open in terms of giving uh, information to our partners so that they can be, so that there can be much more synergy as we work together. There are, of course, several other challenges, banditry, uh, Fulani, herder uh, clashes, the Fulani herder disturbances, especially in some states, uh, new waves of kidnapping and all of that. With the Fulani herder situation, of course, you know that there are two broad groups. First is the encroachment into farms, and I think uh, Doe mentioned that, which, you know, is li- really largely a matter of uh, resources, land resources, fighting over land resources and all of that. Of course, it results in violence, conflicts. We've seen that in Benue, <clears throat> in Zamfara Plateau, in Kebi, Taraba also. But in those areas, in these areas, of course, we, can, we, we know what the problem is. We know that this is a problem over resources. Of course, people can spin it in different ways, but we know essentially that that's the problem. But that's just one. The second is a state of banditry and kidnapping by persons also identified as Fulani herders. Now, this is not the same as full, uh, farmer herder clashes. That's not the same. There's a huge, there's a difference. Now, these are criminals who are, who do not even necessarily have any cattle at all. These are criminals who are kidnapping and who are involved in cattle rustling in some cases and all of that. So we must, uh, and dealing with these two issues, of course, is a completely different thing. Whereas one requires uh, looking at how to ensure that there's a more orderly control over resources and how, how resources are used. But the other is really more a, a criminal problem. We have to arrest the, uh, these individuals and we have to ensure that they are punished and that it is clear to all that they are being arrested and punished. Of course, the police have stepped up quite a bit. The army is also involved in this. But we cannot ignore uh, the fact that we have a nuanced problem here. It's not uh, one thing. You know, there are those who may want to politicize it and say, oh, it's some, you know, some great conspiracy somewhere. But I think that the most important thing to recognize is that if Fulani herders or Fulani, uh, uh, if they are criminals of any kind, they should be, it, it is a matter that we as a government uh, are up to and we must tackle seriously and head on, which is what uh, we're, we're working on. And it's not, it's not we, we mustn't mix it up with uh, farmer herder clashes and those kinds of things. So there are two different, uh, there, there are two different issues. Now, the other uh, issues, of course, you know, with respect to uh, security, I think that one of the most important things that we must emphasize is that our problems are nuanced. Our problems are not, there's no one narrative. And we really have to avoid people who try to oversimplify these problems. Sometimes you read, oh, there's some conflict between uh, the Christian South and the Muslim North, you know, and all of that, especially in the international media. Obviously, that is, you know, just an oversimplification and it's, it's a false narrative. Of course, in the, in the South, you have, uh, you have Christians, you have Muslims in the North, you have Christians, you have Muslims and all of that. And there is, it, we're, we're not talking here of a religious crisis. That's not, that's not the point. In some places, of course, I mean, when you look at, uh, if you compare farmer herder clashes in Samfara State, for example, to farmer herder clashes in Benue, 
whereas in Zamfara, the, both farmers and herders are, Christ, are Muslims, in uh, Benue, farmers are, Christ, most many would probably be Christians, herders are Muslims. So it, we mustn't allow a narrative that seeks to just oversimplify and make uh, and create a situation uh, that may just confuse matters and make it more difficult for us to, to, to understand it and to deal with it. So for me, I think that um, w with respect to security, this, this for us is a, is, a, is a major concern. And we are uh, deploying in various ways uh, what uh, the, the sorts of resources that we believe will work. We're working with the state governments in particular uh, to deal with these uh, concerns. Uh, tomorrow, as I said, we have a major uh, meeting with state governments uh, on uh, security. We're also dealing with the zones, the southwest zone, the northwest, the northeast, uh, the state governments in those areas, and how to support the state governments and how to, you know, to use our resources and theirs uh, to, uh, to deal with many of the security challenges that they have. Technology, of course, is one very important uh, resource that we have to deploy, not only to identify uh, situations where, where uh, criminal activity is taking place, but also uh, to detect and uh, to, to apprehend uh, criminals. And these are some of the things that we're looking at at the moment. I think I'll just stop there so that uh, uh, if there are still opportunities, if there's still an opportunity for questions, I can take uh, the questions. Thank you.